Hello, America, and welcome to Washington, D.C. and to CPAC. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting place to be. It is actually a very exciting place to be. A few years ago, I was at CPAC, and I left there kind of depressed because we were seeing uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood that were included in, uh, in some talks, and I didn't think that the people at CPAC, uh, some of the higher-ups, understood the storm that was coming their way, the storm that we're in right now that has been created by the GOP and the Washington elites. This year, CPAC has really turned a corner. They started with Matt Schlapp uh, uh, two years ago. Yesterday, they just appointed Zudi Jasser to the board of directors, who is one of the Muslims that we have been begging for America to listen to for a very long time. Now he's on the board of directors at CPAC. There's been some speeches today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Mitt Romney and what happened, but Dinesh D'Souza is with us now. And he's got something. Uh, I just saw the trailer for your new movie uh, before we went on, and it is really exciting, dynamic. It's pretty explosive, and it, but we're living at that kind of a time where I think it's, it's all bets are off, and we need to, to raise the curtain and look under some stones and tell some truths that, are being, that have been kept from the American people. Yeah. So um, let's, go, let's go back first, before we go into the movie, let's go back for what I think is the impetus of the movie, the, the beginnings of the movie, um, the conversation that you and I had, which is one of my favorite interviews I've ever done with anyone, because you were so unafraid to talk about your time in prison. And to see your mind work in prison, to see what you learned in prison, and to see your humility through it was fascinating. So take me to you go into prison and you start talking to these. You're a scare, you're you're a guy just like me, scared out of your wits when you first get there, and you listen. Yeah, I didn't. You know, ironically, uh, I was in this confinement center where um, the guys in there were not white collar guys. These weren't uh, doctors who defrauded Medicare or the mayor who was on the take. These were hoodlums. I mean, these were drug smugglers and coyotes, uh, armed robbers. Down the whole, at the border. The whole gamut, yeah. Spanish was the predominant language. Uh, a rough neighborhood, so to speak, with a lot of nuances, different types of gangs and so on. So for the first couple of weeks, I was just very tentative, uh, a little worried about my safety. But after that, I said, look, I'm, I'm in an unusual environment. Let me keep my ears open, and then let me see if I can start talking to these guys, because this is an America I've never seen. Um, and now I'm a part of it, like it or not. So let me make some lemonade out of this, this lemon Unbelievable. here. Unbelievable. Uh, and it turned out to be very eye-opening. I, I think it took me from being an intellectual conservative to being a kind of meat and potatoes conservative. To love. And it enabled me to see the Democratic Party in a, in a, in a little different and less... Uh, I would say blinded light. And you saw them no longer as the academic sees them as people who are doing wrong, but you saw them as truly criminals. The right. same mindset of the thugs on the street that you were with. Yeah, this is straight, you know, Machiavelli. I mean, Machiavelli's thing is that you hear some guy talk and he's going to talk about liberty and justice and patriotism and I'm doing this for all these high motives. But Machiavelli says underneath that, there, there are going to be some low motives because you'll notice that that in doing this he comes to power and then he gains authority over other people and now he has access to wealth that he didn't have before and so when he says justice he's now thinking of a different set of rules than perhaps he even started out with himself and so I think uh, I've gone from looking at America as a clash of ideas to now looking at it as a clash of powerful people and powerful sectors of society vying for who controls this great agglomeration of wealth, $90 trillion, the entire wealth of the entire country, who gets to say how that wealth is deployed? That is a huge shift for you. I, I remember, what was the name of your first book? Well, you remember The Roots of Obama's Rage. You had me on and on Fox. No, but what was your first book? My first book was Illiberal Education. Uh, it was about political correctness. Okay, might have, um, might have been that, back in the 90s, right? Yes. Yeah. And I remember reading your first book and, uh, and seeing such optimism from you. You've always had this very American, Frank Capra kind of look at America. And to when we spoke a few months ago and seeing what you're now bringing to this movie, 
That's a huge change. It's a huge change because now, in a certain sense, whenever I say I love America, there's a part of me that hates America. Uh, in other words, there's a part of me that hears the United States of America versus Dinesh D'Souza ringing in my head. Uh, there's a part of me that sees a bunch of people, like in civics book lessons in American classrooms, I learned better that um, nine guilty men go free than one innocent man be imprisoned. I'm sorry to tell you, I don't believe that's true. I believe that there are lots of innocent people who are in prison. Now, I wasn't one of them. I actually broke the law. I don't think I should have gotten in prison for it, but I did break the law. Uh, there are guys who are in prison who are the result of some prosecutor, some ambitious politician, some scheme. Um, and it's disheartening to see because these are guys, I mean, I can go into prison. I'm a writer. I come out of it. I'm more controversial than when I went in. My career is fine, right? But some doctor who was accused of giving painkillers to somebody, he can't practice again. Some investment guy, he's going to now have to sell real estate. So I saw people whose lives were totally broken by America, by America. And so my patriotism now has to take that into account. So what stops you? I saw, by the way, your, um, your debate with Bill Ayers, which was brilliant. And the only one that I have seen where he really thought he was winning. Did you notice that? He really thought he was winning. And, and you would say something and you just take him apart. It was beautiful. But what stops you from being Bill Ayers, who is standing on the flag? I think the key difference, I asked this very question years ago when I was debating Jesse Jackson, because I was saying to myself, we're debating is America a racist society? And we're looking at the same facts out there. And if we're both honest, how can two people look at the same accident and give radically opposed descriptions of the same data that's in front of us? And my thought was that the reason we do this is that as an immigrant, I'm always comparing America to some other existing country. He is not doing that. He's comparing America to the Garden of Eden, to utopia, <laughs> right? So he's always discontented because America's falling short of this perfection that he holds it to. And it's not wrong to do that, by the way. But the immigrant is, in a way, has lowered expectations. The immigrant knows we live in a world where we're not going to get the best. If things come out OK, then we're doing pretty well. And so ultimately, my optimism comes out of that. It comes out of a view that you expect things to go badly. Yeah. And if they go pretty well, you're reasonably pleased about that. Uh, to me, that's a, that's a realistic conservatism that knows human nature as it is. But and not you said that when you were debating Jesse Jackson. Now you say you have this look, this view where you kind of say, I love America, but I don't love America. I don't love part of America. What stops you from being pushed over the edge? What's, what's having you hold on to? No, but, but that promise is there. It's real. Yeah. Especially, with, especially when you see your movie, Dinesh. Your movie is is very clear, and, and, and your movie makes this point, and we've been saying it for a long time. This will go down, what's happening to us right now, as the biggest robbery in the history of the world. Everybody, everybody who's here, anybody who's saved their money, it's gone. Eventually, it's all gone. Just through inflation, just through what they're doing to inflate the bank, people like Clinton, Soros, all those people, they're going to be fine. But this is the biggest robbery of people in the history of the world, correct? Correct. Uh, I mean, people don't think of it this way, but if you ask the question, what is the greatest thing the world has ever produced? It's America, right? It's not the automobile. It's not the computer. Right. It is the... Because it all came from this it's idea. The, it is the wealth-creating machine that we call America. And the wealth-creating machine was created as an alternative to the confiscation machine, mm -hmm. the theft machine. The, the, you know, Machiavelli says the countries are formed in crime. The borders of most countries in the world are drawn by conquest and crime. America was supposed to be not that. Right. Now, we did have slavery. We did have the conquest from the Indians. So the conquest ethic was in America, but the American idea ran against it. Yes. And, and I bet my life on that idea. I mean, when I came here, I basically said to myself, I don't want to live in a world in which corruption is routinized in everyday life, in which you have roving gangs on the street and criminal gangs uh, who are in political office who can come to your house and take your furniture and take your TV. I don't like that. So I'm going to come to a country where, where I'm an outsider. Uh, I'm a nobody. I have no credit. I have no money. But at least I'm going to be safe from that kind of... Um, um, that kind of thuggery. 
thuggery. Right. And so it was for me just unnerving to see um, that that kind of thuggery is very much here and it's very much now institutionalized in but government. But you know what? That thuggery, um, when, when I did a series on Fox uh, years ago on uh, the roots of the Klan and the roots of the Democratic Party, that thuggery has been here, but it's just been erased by our progressive educational system. It has kick dirt over the tracks of all of that thuggery that has been here. Now, the, 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 the genius of the Democrats in doing this is that, see, it's very difficult to hide a story. To hide a story, you have to force the other side to hide it, too. Because if we're always, if Republicans had been blowing the whistle for a hundred years, there would be nothing hidden. So what the Democrats did is they took all their crimes and they relabeled it the South, right? And so by relabeling it the South, they forced Southerners into a defensive position. The Southerners thought, we did the Klan, we did slavery, we did all these things, right? So then the Southerners become defensive about all that. And that's why there's all this defensiveness about the Confederate flag. These were not Southern crimes. They were crimes of the Democratic Party. The Northern Democratic Party protected slavery as vehemently. So, so the Democrats created a situation where they could hide it and they could make our team hide it too. And they had a beautiful thing going until it's now time to break up that picnic. Yeah, and you do in the movie. You yes. do in the movie. And especially with the conversation about the Klan that's going on with, with Donald Trump. Trump. I was just watching Van Jones with his ceremonial kind of, he's like, that was 50 years ago. Don't tell us what happened 50 years ago. I don't care what happened 50 years ago. Really? So why don't we stop talking about slavery? Slavery was 150 years ago, right? If none of that matters, where does the moral capital for the Democratic Party come from? Where does all this claim to being the party of civil rights and human rights, it all comes out of that. So well, let me ask you this. Where does our moral capital come from? As, um, I'm, as I'm sitting here at CPAC, um, I didn't think CPAC stood for anything six, seven, eight years ago. It lost its way. The Republicans lost their way. Donald Trump was not created by the Tea Party. It was created by the GOP, not standing for anything. And so somebody who can come in who is completely a vacuum, it has no principles that are set in stone, is not known for being uh, having a certain ideology. And he just fills this space because people want to hit government over the head with a two by four. So it's not enough to win. It's not enough to be against the Democrats. It's not enough to stop Hillary Clinton. It, well, that won't work. What is it we what is it we are? What is it we're for? What does this party stand for? You know, at the end of the day, that, that, that kind of question of first principles is very critical. And by the way, it's critical for the liberals, too. I always say to a liberal, in what society would you be a conservative? In other words, you want tax rates to go up. Okay, how much? At what point do even you say stop? What do you think is the it's idea? The NFL question. And they never say, right? They're yeah. always like, well, I want them to be more. But they'll never, Obama never says what the fair share is. Sure. Now, on our side, we are conservatives, but what are we conserving, right? I believe we're conserving the principles of the American Revolution. So the irony is that we're conservatives, but we're conserving a certain type of liberalism, which is classical liberalism. Mm -hmm. And that is what animates us. Now, we, don't, we know we don't live in an agricultural society. And so the world is totally different 200 years later in 21st century America. So our job, CPAC's job, your job, my job, is to define what does it mean to be a conservative? What do those principles mean when it's applied today? today? Right. And that's what we're fighting for. What are the, what are the principles that as we're putting them back together right now, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we agree on many principles except win. What are the? Give me, give me the base, the number one principle or the top three principles. Well, you say we must agree on these things. We we, we think of the American founding as a as a, uh, a revolution for liberty. I think we often miss as conservatives it was also a revolution for justice. So the liberals have grabbed that issue. And when we play the card liberty, they play the card justice. justice. And we either tie or they take the hand because justice, Aristotle says, is the primary virtue of any society. And so it seems to me that conservatism now, we kind of own the liberty issue to a large degree, but we need to contest the other one. We can easily win the justice if we are saying, that's what Bernie Sanders is talking right now about fairness. Fairness. And, and fairness to me is interpreted as equal justice for all. You know what I mean? 
equal justice, not I'm going to make everybody the same. That's the way they interpret it. But American fairness is equal justice. If I would go to jail, if you would go to jail for breaking the law, think you went to jail for a, a, a paper crime. Hillary Clinton should be in prison. She's running for president. That's not equal justice. Exactly. So and we so, can own that if we are just. Right. So, you know, on social media, people will say to me, you broke the law. And I say, yeah, I broke the, I broke the law and I deserve to be punished. But uh, justice is also a matter of proportioning the penalty to the crime. It's making sure that other guys who did the same thing get roughly the same penalty. Right. So there's criminal justice, there's political justice, and then there's economic justice. Uh, economic justice is, are the allocations of capitalism just. Not are they efficient, but are they fair? We have to defend that principle against the left. And that's what that Bernie Sanders challenge, he assumes they're unfair. He never says why they're unfair. But, you know, if there are 100 guys here and we all have 10 bucks and you write a novel and all of us voluntarily give you a dollar to buy your book, now there's inequality. You have all this money from all of us. We all have less. You are now the 1%. But have you cheated me? No, I gave you the dollar voluntarily. Mm -hmm. You gave me a service in return for it. No one's been cheated. We've got to go to that level to make our case to the American people. I love the way your mind works. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. It comes, your movie comes out? The movie is out in July, the, probably the week of the Democratic Convention. They tell their story. And yeah. we tell their story. Yeah, that's so great. And we will uh, we'll have uh, more on that. We're going to cover it because you used our Oval Office for some of the, the shoots. And uh, uh, we're really excited for you to see this movie. I, I just saw the trailer, and it is mind-blowing. Really, really good. Going to tell the story of the true history of the Democratic Party. And this one you'll want everyone to see um, because... Nobody knows this story. Nobody knows this story. Thank you. It's a pleasure. God bless. Okay, let me tell you about our sponsor when we come back.